So I, I started out with this title, Amazon Forest Interactions with Earth's Climate System, and then I added a subtitle. And so hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand what disturbance regimes in the hypertropics means. So um, I, in 2003, I moved to New Orleans. And I'm from Santa Cruz. I grew up in Santa Cruz. I'm actually like fourth generation California on both sides. My grand, great grandparents came from Madeira Island and had apricot and apple, or, apple orchards up in Brentwood. Uh, but I ended up getting my first faculty job about right there, which is New Orleans. And in 2005, it was a Saturday, and you know we, we, we knew that, that there was some threat here. But it didn't look like this when I went to sleep on Saturday evening. And so I actually already made a reservation, because I was told, if you're going to do this right, you want to make a reservation well ahead of time. So you know the tracks are actually fairly accurate now. So I made a reservation for a couple days in Hot Springs, Arkansas, because I thought it was, it's out of, over here. It's off the track. And I thought, that sounds like a nice place to evacuate from a, from a hurricane, right? So I, I woke up. It must have been 4 AM on a Sunday. And at the time, I was looking at this blog from this guy, Jeff Masters, who works with the Weather Underground. And he's got the best hurricane blog. And just before I went to sleep, he said, you know, I think everything's kind of pointing to the storm strengthening overnight. So here I am in bed. It's 4 AM. And I'm thinking, strengthening overnight. What, what, what does that mean? You know, in, in this sense, so I, I got up, and it's 4 AM, and this is what I see. And I thought, you know, when, when this city wakes up, we're in trouble. And so I, I woke my wife up, who's from Brazil. She's from Rio. And at the time, she didn't even really understand the difference between tornadoes and hurricanes, because they don't have either one of them. And she doesn't like to get up in the morning. She's not really a morning person. <laughs> and I kind of am. And so she kind of, she's, she's, she's used to my energy in the morning. And so I woke her up. It's 4 AM. And I said, you know, we got to get out of here. And she's like, what are you talking about? And so I, I brought the laptop to the bed. And I said, see? And she said, That's, that looks scary. And so by 5 AM, I have a, a headlight on. And I'm, I'm, I'm basically attaching uh, uh, plywood to our windows at 5 AM. Our neighbors had just moved in, so I think they thought I was completely psycho. And then we left, and we went to Hot Springs, Arkansas. And then the next day, on Monday, this is what we saw. It, the, the storm came. So the, here's Lake Pontchartrain, New Orleans. It's about right here. Here's Louisiana. Here's Mississippi. And there's a, there's a river here called the Pearl River. And so Katrina made landfall at, at the Pearl River. And uh, we, you know, Similar to just crazy events that happen in the world, we just were glued to CNN. Because it was interesting. When, when you first saw this, we thought, whew, we dodged a bullet. It was a category like two, maybe quite three storm at this point. Um, but what we didn't know and what wasn't being reported was this storm was carrying a category five storm surge. It was carrying a storm surge. The, the storm surge at this point right here, Bay St. Louis, was 30 feet. 30 feet, right? And so what happened is, is that this lake swelled up 30 feet, and it put too much strain on those flood walls. So there were literally flood walls in the city. I mean, you had a home here, and you had a wall, and then you had a channel that went into this lake. And there was all that pressure being put on that, because you just added 30 feet to that, right? So what happens is the flood walls started collapsing. So it wasn't until a few hours after we kind of had a sigh of relief that we realized that it's really, really bad, right? So um, they, you know, the city was closed down. Um, fortunately, we had just bought a, a new car. I had a car that was like 10 years old. And so we traveled across the country. Uh, we came back to California. And uh, so let, let me just get, so at the time, I was working in Brazil. I'd been working in Brazil for many, many years, maybe 15 years by this time. And at the time, I was working on this NASA project and we were kind of starting to scale up our work to the landscape using satellites. And one of the things that we were doing was looking at how wind disturbances affect the forest in the Amazon. And we were building all these tools, right? So here I am you know, driving across the country thinking. And I thought, wow, I could just take those tools that we were developing for the Amazon and just apply them to this to kind of see you know, what's the impact of this storm on the forest. So there's a, you know, we, we know a lot about how this storm affected um, you know, the local populations. 
and, and it was a it was a massive uh, disaster and this huge diaspora of people that that uh, fled this region, and many eventually made their their way back. But so we you know we were looking at forests and disturbance, and so just to show you. So this tool we were using is this thing called spectral mixture analysis. And what it does is it creates these false color, color images so that green here means like healthy vegetation and red means dead stuff or asphalt or whatever it might be. And then blue is kind of everything else. And so this is before, so this is Bay St. Louis, the place that was hit by the 30 foot storm surge. So this is before the storm and this is a landsat image. It's just a matter of scale here. Here's an airport, here's a golf course, here's the I-10 that crosses the United States, right? So here's before and here's after. So, so green to red means vegetation died and obviously impact everywhere else too. This is Lake Pontchartrain and Bio Sauvage and the I-10 going across the, the lake there. So here's before and here's after. And then this is, this is the Pearl River. And at the time when I moved, so you know, I'm I'm basically an ecologist and I study trees. And uh, when I moved to New Orleans in 2003, I set up some research plots up in here, here to kind of look at forest dynamics and stuff. And here's the Pearl River, and here's before, and here's after, right? So you can see, you can see all this here. And all. So, so what we did was we essentially, we, we, we took these same tools that I was developing for the Amazon to look at disturbance there. And we basically made a difference from, so this, basically this minus that, which is this here. And then anything in gray here is not a forest. And anything in, that's colored here is a forest. And the, the color scale is the intensity of the impact. And so you see, wow, some of these forests, really nothing happened. And these other forests were totally destroyed. It turns out that. Um, what's happening here is, is that these are flooded forests that have like cypress and tupelo. I don't know if you know much about the trees of the south. But these are trees that have these really tapered um, trunks and they kind of interlocking roots and none of them went down. They were just completely resistant to this, to, to this wind. Whereas right next door in these oak, maple, sweet gum forests, everything was flattened. So that was interesting. And, the other, and then we basically came up with this way of scaling this storm, and we, so we set up a bunch of plots, and then we randomly put them in our GPS, and then we would go out to that site, and then we would estimate how many trees went down at that site, and then we came up with this way of scaling that to the whole, kind of this whole region that was affected by tropical storm force winds or above, and we came up with a number. I mean, this has actually never really been done before where we could say how many trees were destroyed in the storm, and that was the number. So a lot of trees. Um, and then there's a big carbon flux associated with that. So this is actually where most, in fact, I, th th that was the kind of the first time I'd ever really taken my research out of the tropics and was doing something local there. Most of my work has been here. I started working in Manaus and the in Brazilian Amazon in around 93. And our research sites, at least for most of the work I've done, is kind of up in here, in this region here. And one of the things I'm interested in understanding is how climate will affect, climate change will affect um, forests in the tropics. So interestingly enough, so you can see here January 2005, right? So this is just a few months after Katrina. And part of the reason why you had all this, so it was the most hurricanes ever recorded in the North Atlantic that year, 2005. And it turns out with all this heat up here, it was also creating um, some interesting atmospheric patterns in the Amazon. And so there's this kind of coupling using this thing called the Hatley cell circulation, where when you have um, warmth here, it can cause uh, the storm tracks to uh, essentially track the opposite. So usually in the tropics, you have these trade winds that blow in from the east, right? But in this case, you can see this massive storm is propagating from the southwest to the east, which is a strange direction for a storm there. And this was a really powerful storm. A student of mine in, in, at Impa in, in Manaus, she sent me an, an email a few days after this. And she said, wow, we had this massive storm 
boats were capsized, you know, homes were destroyed. And so, um, and so one of the things that happen when you have these um, big storms like this, at least in the Amazon, you don't get you know, cyclones in the Amazon. You actually don't get cyclones anywhere near the equator because of the Coriolis force. But what you do get is you get these things called downbursts. And downbursts, if I can put it simply, is you've got a big storm and winds are moving vertically through that cloud base. So they're moving vertically, right? And they achieve these ridiculous speeds because of this feedback associated with the, um, as, as that droplet moves vertically, it warms up, and it re-vaporizes, and it creates additional energy to drop even faster. And so some of, these, some of these blasts can reach up to like 200 miles per hour, these concentrated wind blasts. They're called downbursts. And as you might expect, um, it's not good to experience these if you're in an aircraft, because your aircraft will be slammed into the runway. And in fact, in the 80s, this guy Fujita came up with a way of tracking these things using radar. Because aircraft were going down with these events. Aircraft don't do well in winds that go this direction. So that's what it looks like when it hits when one of these mics. So this is uh, that's about 10 kilometers long and maybe you know three and a half kilometers wide. That's about 800 football fields worth of forest that were just flattened by one of these events. <clears throat> Um, that's just north of the of our study site. That was in '97. Here's 2005. This is a, this road that we call ZF2 um, in 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 Manaus, and this is um, this is in 2004. And then 2005, you see all this red, right? Which in this case means you've lost the canopy. Trees have gone down, and so um, using the same approach that we did for Katrina, we basically randomly picked a bunch of pixels here, a bunch of points, right, and then plugged it into our GPS, and then did some um, fairly exhaustive hiking to get out to these sites and measure how many trees go down. And so that's Juliano Guimarães doing some master's field work on how, what fraction of the trees went down. And then what we can do is we can make a mortality map. So in this case, so if you look at, for example, if you look at this patch right here, which is essentially this patch right there, you know, about 80% of the trees went down. So similarly, we can calculate the mortality flux, the carbon flux, etc. So why do we want to do this? Well, so we know that we're pumping all this carbon into the atmosphere and it's warming the climate. And we also know, actually, I'm going to go to the next slide so I can. The other thing that we know, and I'll go back in a second. The other thing that we know is, so we're emitting about 12 billion tons of carbon a year. No question about that. And then when we measure the atmosphere, we only find half of it. So we're missing 6 billion tons. And you think, wow, you, you would think that we would be able to figure out where that's going. It's a lot. Well, the oceanographers seem to say that they're pretty convinced they can account for three of that. And there's also pretty good evidence that the other three are going into the land somewhere. But we really don't have a good handle on that other three. So the interesting thing is, is that for every ton of carbon that you emit to the atmosphere and whatever you do in your daily lives, only half of it is staying in the atmosphere. And half of that half is going to the oceans. And the other half, we're not exactly sure where it's going. Um, but the other thing that um, we're looking at is how reliable or how, um, how sustained is this, what's called this terrestrial sink? Can we rely on this? Because if, if, if this shuts down or this shuts down, then climate is even going to accelerate even faster. It's already moving pretty fast, but it'll go even faster, right? So going back to here, so every forest has this kind of disturbance regime with respect to how many, so every year a number of trees will just die in a forest. You know, a storm comes through, a few trees die, sometimes larger patches. So there's um, the area that's disturbed, the magnitude within that patch, so what fraction of the trees go down, and then how frequently they occur, right? And so the concern 
with respect to what I just talked to you guys about and the climate system is if a warming climate kind of intensifies this regime, then you get more dead trees. And these dead trees are basically consumed. They're eaten up by fungi and other things. And then they res they're, it's respired as CO2 back to the atmosphere, right? So if you increase the regime, you, you can basically um, you can shut this off. Or at least you can slow it down. And then climate even accelerates even faster. It's called like a positive feedback loop. So that's the concern, and that's what we're looking at. Um, so how might this play out? Well, what this shows here is um, for the Amazon, for Southeast Asia, and for Africa, the expected change in temperature over the next 100 years that's driven by a changing climate for those regions, right? And you can see that you know, somewhere between 2 and 4 degrees, or 2 and 6 degrees Celsius of change we expect by the end of this century, right? The other interesting thing is, is that, so we have this climate we're in now, right? And we, we kind of like it. It's going to be getting a little bit warm, and it's going to get a lot warmer. But, you know, like, you go back 15,000 years, and what was happening 15,000 years ago? Ice age. Ice age. And so these, this warm period is actually a small fraction of kind of evolutionary time or geological time, right? So over the past few million years, 90% of that time has been glaciated. 10% has been like this, right? So we're, we're also kind of glacial animals in a way. We're just, although I think we do pretty well in interglacial climates as well, especially this last one, we've done really well um, as a species. Um, but the thing is, is that we're we're going to put sometime this century, we're going to push the tropics outside of temperatures that they've experienced for probably millions of years. Because that's our warmest climate right now. It's the warmest, wettest climate is these tropical forests, right? And we're pushing the temperatures beyond what we've experienced in these last inter interglacial periods. We're pushing it outside of that. So we're going to create so novel climates. We're, 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 so it, it, it's a challenge to, I mean, how will, the, how will people or in ecosystems, how will, any, how, how will systems respond to these climates that they haven't really experienced? I mean, it's not just about what trees are going to do. It's about what people are going to do. Um, and then, so here's, here, to kind of show this graphically, so here's all the ecosystems of the planet with temperature and precipitation, right? So you know, you've got your tropical wet forest, dry forest, you've got ice, you've got tundra, you've got boreal forest, you've got deserts. It all maps on to temperature and precip, which is all this blue stuff here, right? And then these orange points are where we're going to shift temperatures and precipitation by 2100. So all this is, all this is just, it's complete, it's, you're going to shift, so what's, what do you call it? Well, we've started, we're writing a paper now that is referring to this as hypertropical climates, because they don't exist. You have to put a new name. I mean, there's some nice names here for what you got, but we're moving it. So, so you might want to refer to this. So what, 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 what are hyper, hypertropical climates going to do to people that live in the tropics? It's, <laughs> you know, and this, what this shows is a range of estimates, right? So this is when. This is pessimistic. This is when we don't do, this is when we say, hey, I recycled my aluminum can. I mean, that's not enough. That's this line. This line here means just basically revolutionary. You know, it will make the free speech movement of the 60s look like the little small local event. I mean, it requires radical change to get to that line, right? Is that, yeah? What kind of temperatures are you talking about? Well, so, um, Let's see, what, th what this shows, it actually doesn't show the, the temperatures. What this shows is what fraction of the Earth will be in a hypertropical climate using these different scenarios. So this is, a, this is a very optimistic scenario, and this is a very pessimistic scenario. And we're actually following this line quite closely. Because now we have like 20 years to go back and say, hey, 20 years ago we said, hmm, that's pessimistic. So what happened? Well, we stayed right on that line for the last 20 years. Yeah. So you're saying that about 15% it's going to move from 
around three percent, less than three percent in 2020 to. 15 percent, 15 percent, yeah. The end of the yeah, if, if this scenario plays out, that's right, 15 percent. Yep. So I couldn't have a talk without giving you guys a nice complicated figure, right? Because since I, I'm a scientist. So what this shows is the plots and, and how the mortality rates in that 2000, and, oh, the, so in addition, so I told you about Katrina, and then I told you about that big storm. In addition, there was a massive drought in the Amazon in 2005, which is shown here. So this basically shows um, how much less water you had that year for plants than you would have in a normal year. So, and then five years later, there was another one of these mega droughts in the Amazon, 2010. Um, in the 2005 drought, there was a lot of mortality associated with this. And I think 2005 kind of got rid of most of the trees, and there wasn't as much here. But um, essentially what it shows is um, the effect of that drought on, so you know, we talked about storms and how you can change the disturbance regime. In this case, you can also get powerful droughts that are associated with a changing climate in the tropics. And they also affect trees and mortality and these fluxes. Um, obviously, drought also affects people. Is drought just a change in the amount of water or an actual value of water? Yeah. So to have a drought, you have to take what you have. So for example, here, it's almost always dry in the summer because we have a Mediterranean climate. That is not a drought. No, That's our climate. California, or we could call it California climate. <laughs> so a drought has to be outside of the long-term mean or the long-term climate of that region. So now we're calling it a drought because, I mean, we really aren't getting precipitation. So we're moving outside of our normal kind of precipitation pattern here. So and then another study using, so you know, we use radar to track storms. So when you want to know, is it going to rain today, you go to a radar map and it shows you. Well, you can also map the kind of moisture content in, in, in a forest and how that responds. So that's what this shows. That's a, actually a satellite that has a radar that looks at kind of canopy moisture. And what, what, what happened here is, is that you know things are kind of cruising along fine. And then the 2005 drought hits predominantly in this area here, which dried the forest. And that radar data showed that. But then it never really recovered. If you just look at this in optical data, things get green pretty quick, but um, it was still significantly dry or kind of had some kind of structural problems. There are other potential problems to forests, like, and, and you don't see these in the tropics. Um, it's probably because the diversity is too high. So, you know, these beetles, they attack like one species of tree, and you've got in the tropics tens of thousands of species of trees. So it seems like the beetles can't really um, decimate the forest. But I mean, that's a huge, like, see, see this, this, you know, this North America, right? That's Canada. That's British Columbia, right? And this huge area has just been wiped out by these beetles. So they love warm weather. And they're getting more, more warm weather up there. Fires. So um, fires are expected to become more intense. Um, and when they do burn, burn with uh, so higher frequency and greater intensity when they do happen. And a lot of that has to do with you know if you if you increase the uh, if you increase the, uh, the 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 season where there isn't essentially snow on the ground, then you have a longer time to kind of dry out the fuel. And so the summers that happen in the spring are more intense. Um, so these are fires are also expected to increase as the climate system warms and as we get more droughts. But in the tropics, it's usually associated with the land use. So this is actually a product that was developed in collaboration between Google and the University of Maryland. So you guys probably all know like Google Maps, right? So um, there's also something called Earth Engine. Google's Earth Engine. I don't know if you know about this. So what it is is it's basically stitched together all the Landsat. So you can go to your favorite point on the planet, and you can see how it's changed over the last 30 years um, using this. But it's at the resolution of like 30 by 30 meters. So it doesn't have the resolution so you can look at your you know, the swimming pool in your backyard or whatever. But 
you can see these big, like if you go to Las Vegas and look at how Las Vegas has changed over the last 30 years, it's, or Abu Dubai, unbelievable change, right? Um, but you can also look at that, so in this case, they're mapping out deforestation over these 12 years, and so here's the Amazon, right? And here's the Amazon River, right, here. And then you can see all this very detailed land use. And also, um, during these drought years that um, in some cases could be associated with climate change, you get a lot more burning. So, you know, fires used a lot in the tropics because generally the forests don't burn. You, you burn your scraps and then it kind of goes out. But during drought, these fires can kind of get away and create um, big problems for not just the, these um, forests, but also for the people living there. So, so that's basically it for that. And the, so just so that you know, we're 50 years, right, with the free speech movement. I was born in 1964, so um, I don't remember this, but um, I was like five months old when it happened. But I definitely remember the 60s being, um, you know, we were, there, were, there was a lot more momentum with the social movements, right? And then, so Paul Fine, who's in integrated biology here, he said, hey, let's go check out this, uh, the, the, the speeches. And we went and, uh, uh, I didn't take this picture, but I could have, because I was standing maybe right here with Paul. And we were thinking, why is it that, you know, I mean, we're talking about something that's going to radically change the whole planet. And it's going to affect not just ecosystems, but people too. Why is it that, you know, we don't really get this kind of level of, you know, public mobilization. We, we don't. We haven't. Weren't there half a million people in Manhattan the other day? But it, just, it's, yeah, it, it doesn't rise to this. It doesn't rise to this because this changed everything. And we've changed nothing. It's a stage of the way. It's not the end. It's a stage. Excuse me. Yeah? Changes sometimes happen slowly. Yep. Like the anti-Vietnam like anti movement. That started with a couple thousand people. And then after six months, maybe 10,000. After, it took almost two, three years to get up to a million, yeah. and then they started listening. So the fact that, that 400,000 people showed up in New York, and we had demonstrations all over the world that supported it, there were 5,000 of Lake Merritt, is a very, very hopeful sign. Because, I mean, we're acting almost too late on this, but if we're gonna save the future, uh, this is a great start. The, the thing in New York. Yeah. So, it, in other words, <clears throat> even Obama made, made a really good speech about what we have to do. It doesn't mean he's going to do a lot. But for here, hmm? politics. They 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 they're, they've essentially pretended to take this seriously, but nothing's happened, right? No, but the thing <laughs> is, is that when the people <laughs> rise up, you know, then yeah, the politicians are forced to listen, especially when we get up to a million or, or even more. Yeah. But this and, movement had, had a much more um, specific focus. It was focused on the administration of the University of California. And the focus of the environmental movement is much, much more diffuse. I mean, it's... it's no, this became, I mean, it became kind of a, almost a global, I mean, it was definitely, I mean, right? The, the, the kind of social political movements of the yeah, 60s definitely had... Well, these people, these people were influenced by a lot of them, like Mario Savio and Jack Weinberg, who was in the car, they're, they worked in the civil rights movement before yeah. the free speech and movement. He, he was, then, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then they uh, they uh, had the free speech movement because they couldn't they couldn't do anything political on campus, so they, they challenged it, they won, and it catapulted, you know, it created a lot of protesters student-wise, but then there was the anti-Vietnam, yeah. lots of other things came after that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it killed a lot of other I mean, the civil rights changed pretty significantly from this. There was a lot of, you know, legislation. The EPA was created not too far after this. I mean, there were a lot happened between this and like 1970, but you haven't seen it on climate. I mean, there's just been why do 400,000 people. Why do you think so, that is? No, we were, so we were standing there and we were kind of, afterwards we started, so why is it? Why? And and the Coke, the Coke, <laughs> they're worth like, uh, Almost eighty billion dollars. Yeah. They put a hundred million dollars into uh, the media uh, and other venues to, to convince people that global warming yeah. is a hoax. Well, they did that to Rachel Carlson of Silent Spring too. Yeah, they did. And 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 it didn't it didn't last. The movement actually 
was capable of shifting things, whereas, people, yeah? Well, people are seeing through it. They're seeing through the Koch brothers. So oh, that's a good yeah. sign. Yeah. It's all a good sign. Mm, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I feel that the, <clears throat> part of your comparison is that the, the social movements of the 60s, whether we're talking about free speech, civil rights, or, or, uh, or subsequent anti-Vietnam War protests, they're all socially conditioned. They're all, they're all uttered in terms that people understand, race, society, power. In the climate thing, you guys are the ones who are, you know, informing us, but you talk about two degrees Celsius and, and the charts and the Google planet and all that stuff. Yeah. And people just turn off because they're yeah. not, they, were, they got turned off on science in high school and college. It's like, I can't do this. Yeah. I'm just going to do English literature or political science or yeah. something. So it's part of the responsibility, and, and the climate people, perhaps <coughs> present company excluded, <coughs> took a very long time to be assertive about the mutual consistency of the climate models. There was all this, oh, it doesn't work, oh, this doesn't work, this is out of yeah. And all the time, they're equivocating. The Koch brothers are, <laughs> are not are equivocating. Saying, no, no. <laughs> Even though they're going to be completely right. off base, but they're very clear in their messaging. So the problem is, is getting a social movement on the basis of science or the intersection of science and social movements. And that's a little bit hard to get those two horses to go in the same direction. Yeah. yeah. What's the Brazilian government doing about this? <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting. So, I mean, you know, Brazil, so the deforestation rates in Brazil have dropped dramatically, although they kind of spiked a little bit. So there's that. I mean, you, it's hard to say if that was actually the Brazilian government. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, there's, there's one thing. What are you doing about some kind of local issue? But then, you know, there's the larger issue of just carbon emissions or, you know, what we're putting into the atmosphere. And, and the bottom line is outside of let's say Germany or some of the northern European countries that are actually independently doing pretty significant things. California actually has... Yeah, we have, we have, yeah. we're leaders. Yeah, we're, we're definitely leaders here on that. I mean, we've, we have some legislation that by 2050, I don't know what the fraction is, will come from whatever kind of... But actually, it's not sufficient, right? I mean, it has to be kind of a global... Do you have maybe more that's slides? part of it, too. Do you have more slides? Um, not too many. Now, I'm just curious, what was the follow-up to this? <laughs> so, so let's just go through this, though. So you know, for, for, for a decade, so we wanted to come up with some simple metric that we could say we, we, we can't go beyond this, otherwise it's really bad news, right? And that's two degrees Celsius. And what, you, what, what, what um, uh, let's see, where's the, uh, oh, these guys. What, what they're arguing here is, is that, you know, we need to come up with better ways to measure the stress that uh, people are placing on these systems, not just, and he goes through to describe why. So I guess part of my, so I, I wanted to bring this up too, like, you know, why is it that we're not able to kind of rally the, rally the troops around preventing what, you know, will be, you know, the other thing that, so I, I wanted to come up with a couple other easy statistics here for you guys to remember. So by, by 2100, we're either going to have a foot or three feet of sea level rise everywhere without question. So, okay. But you know what's more interesting, well, I don't know, more interesting, more frightening, but it's actually kind of scientifically um, interesting, is that, you know, once you put heat inertia in these systems, you, 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 you know, you can't stop it. It's just the inertia is just, it, it's, it's immense. And so what we're really talking about is that, and, and I'm going to have to pull up the stat because I probably won't get it right, is that, so what, what, what we're ta actually talking about is, is that when it finally equilibrates, you'll get seven feet of sea level rise for every one degree change in temperature, one degree. We've already done a degree. So 2100 is an arbitrary point. So, I mean, we know that within a couple hundred years, the, the coastlines of the planet are going to be completely rewritten. Maybe it's hard to rally some people around these things that are kind of far off. Um, so, when, so, I guess, so my next question was, was basically this. When, when will it happen? I mean, what does it take? I mean, you can kind of, you know, like you say, you can, the scientists can talk about all this cool, groovy, you know, quantitative stuff they do, like how we quantify the flux of carbon and all this. And I think a lot of people just kind of think, kind of turn it off, right? But what does it take? <laughs> you know, 
what, what does it take to actually, um, how, how, so, you know, here we go. So you're, we're 2015 now, and then, you know, we're marching along by 2030, 50, 2100. I mean, where, where, where's the point in which we just say, okay, we've had enough of the Koch brothers? Sometimes and, it takes a major disaster to wake people up. In uh, this last March, 400,000 people in New York, a lot of those people were from victims of Hurricane Sandy. They were directly experienced effects of global warming. So a lot of them are, have, are becoming activists. Unfortunately, they're a, they're a small group of people. It's like a lot of us haven't been directly affected. It's something that's going to happen 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future, and most people are worried about their economics or, or whatever it is. And there's, and there's, see, there's trillions of dollars of oil still in the earth. And the oil companies don't want it to go to waste. If we change, all that money is lost. And they're holding out as long as possible, uh, you know, tearing up the earth, the coal company and everybody else, you know, trying to exhaust all, I mean, get all these profits before they have to change. And they, but we have to pressure them. And, and I, again, I think New York is, is the beginning, and young people are starting to rise up, which they haven't. I've been around this since the 60s. And we had all kinds of problems getting young people to get climate, I mean, environmental demonstrations. Uh, have you heard of a group called Earth First? Sure. We yeah. spent, I, I've been with them for 25 years. We spent 20 years, uh, people getting arrested, 50 people living in trees, but we saved 8,000 acres of redwood trees. It took an enormous effort. So it's like, it, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's the oil companies, the corporations, and actually who own the politicians. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem. And there are a lot of people who are saying system change along with climate. You know. Yeah. And it was interesting, too. So that was, I mean, I think mm -hmm. some of that movement was strongest in maybe the 80s, 90s, what you were just talking about with, uh, like? From the late 80s yeah. through, uh, through the maybe 2000. I would almost. 2005, yeah. we had a big trial against the FBI and Oakland Police, we won. And it kind of, and then another, they started logging up north sustainably, where the people, uh, they were doing all the clear cutting, they were, they were gone. Yeah. So in other words, things got better. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I heard some, yeah. Another issue, you know, this is uh, Fish. There was, a, there was a professor here at UC Berkeley about a year ago. He's a world authority on fish. And, and he gave this great presentation. I said, well, at the end, what is your, what is your conclusion on fish in the future? And he says, well, in 60 or 70 years, fish we take for granted are going to be rare. Mm. And he says, in 100 years, the way we're going, mm. there'll be no fish in the ocean because of the acidification. And, the, the, you know, I mean, yeah. this is something in the, in the future where some people just, oh, we'll, we'll get to it. Yeah. And like you said, that there, so this is about climate, which is one kind of, well, it's a big topic, but it's narrower than all these other concerns, like fisheries, for example. But there are, there are connections, too. Have you heard of the Amazon Watch? Um, the Amazon sir. Watch. Yeah. The they're a terrific group worldwide, but they're, they're, they're one of their, their central offices are right here in Oakland. Mm -hmm. James Cameron is a member of them. And he was influenced by them to make Avatar, which actually, if you really think about it, was an environmental film. But, you know, you know, indigenous people protecting their and, and being taken over. And uh, he's done a lot of good work. The Amazon Watch people are terrific, but they're not well known. Yeah. So what, I'm just curious what kinds of connections you could make on the, so this really interesting application of satellite imagery that you're using <coughs> for your research. How you could link that to the kind of social activism that you hmm. I assume you would like to see it when you showed the picture of the FSM. So, so like, what would be part two, or what? Would, <clears throat> how would you connect? How would you connect the human with this this sort of large scale climate that's going on? Both what people are doing that's increasing the presence of these kinds of storms or these down these down yeah side, in, side in some areas, yeah. So, what would you? I mean, what where would because I think that's how you mobilize people, is helping people to see yeah. the connection. 
of what was interesting yeah. is, is that so so you were pointing out that you know um, like some of this protected redwood forests and some of it was successful. I mean, think about the Montreal Protocol. I mean, we actually stopped pumping CFCs in the atmosphere, but that was also because you know <laughs> if we lost the ozone layer and we all just started getting carcinoma across the board, people realized, well, okay, we actually do need to deal with this one because it, it, there was an urgency there, right? But you know, a lot of it seemed to me like maybe in the 80s or the early 90s, um, people were, there was more of an interest to become mobilized by what the scientists were saying where we were headed. And maybe there's not as much of, but, but outside of like what you just said, there's this, there was this big um, um, rally in, in New York and it's kind of spread globally to some extent. But I don't know, it hasn't really quite got to the level where it's actually influencing policy, right? Well, maybe it's and, cynical because if you look at the, because you point out the issue around the sort of between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn towards the equator, the, the intensification there. Well, how much popula world's population lives there, and how powerful is that population? I think the idea that you put at the end, which is the submerging of the coastlines, where in high-income nations you have the majority of wealthy people. Who are who have a vested interest and are probably politically more powerful to to mobilize about that issue than you know there are 20 million people living in the Amazon basin now about which was you know it's a lot more than there were 500 years ago there were maybe six six million people at the outside mm. so but they're not a very powerful force right mm -mm. now. Well, or the South Pacific island nations that yeah. are losing their nations. Yeah, because those are many states, yeah. you know, there are many states. Well, except for Indonesia, which is yeah. not many states. I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to finish your presentation. Oh, I, have, it's, have, it, it, I think it's basically done. <laughs> okay. That was it. <laughs> we do have time for I, a few more yeah. questions. So, should we stay on that one or that one? <laughs> that's, that's the upper Rio Negro right there. Yeah. This is a much nicer story. <laughs> we do have time for a few more questions. Well, I was wondering about climatologists themselves becoming activists and you know, showing some. Well, so Paul. Yeah. What's, Jim, uh, what's his name? Jim Hansen, yeah. Changed himself to you know, mining equipment in the Appalachians saying, you know, coal is part of this whole thing. And uh, it'd be nice to see some stepping down from the ivory tower heights mm. and more climatologists becoming activists themselves rather than waiting for the people to respond yeah. to technical sermons. You know, I think the sort of leadership would be yeah. So, and you are seeing it, like like you say, with um, Paul Hansen and um, there. Are, I mean, I guess there are a lot of different kind of ways in which people can get involved as well. Um, you can become yeah. a public spokesperson and sort of step it down. Unfortunately, Jim Hansen is going to be hard to sit through for too long. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he's not always the most effective speaker. Well, I'm talking about just changing. Yeah. You know, I think that was, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no, okay. yeah. Um, this is also something that is, like, at, at large conferences, um, like the American Geophysical Union, uh -huh. there's a whole section on it which is devoted to communication of science. Right? So there are certainly movements in the scientific community to try to address exactly these sorts of issues. Um, but it's, it's difficult. Um, there's a lot of obstacles to overcome in terms of being effective in that way. And it's not, sorry, not, it's not just about being too technical either. It's, um, you know, it's a lot to, I mean, it's difficult for sci scientists to have to be, how many different hats are they supposed to wear? Um, it's difficult. Yeah, it's, that, that's, that's a tough one too. Like you've got your essentially your career. And then to sh if that becomes your career, then that's, well, that's a big career decision, but maybe it's about it becoming part of you know what you do, too. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. like this talk here. I mean, I felt like this enabled me to kind of have a more of a social message. Like I wouldn't give a talk like this if I was invited to an you know an Earth System Science Department talk or something along those lines. So why not? Why not? <laughs> well, because. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think that in general, like, I, I think it's also important to get the, get, get, get the fact. To get the facts. I mean, the reason why we're here, because where we're headed is way out. And the only reason that we kind of know where we're headed is because of the science. And it's really challenging science, right? So in order to kind of better understand just where we're going, we have to keep doing that science part too, right? And so there's a lot of, I mean, the scientists are all on board with knowing that this is a big problem. And so actually, we're more interested in the details and how to figure out how do you predict what's going to happen to the climate right here. Mm -hmm. We actually don't, the regional climates and how those play out aren't well, well understood. So, so there's still a lot of interesting things to do to solve this big problem. And I think that's why we tend to focus on that in, more, in the more science groups. Well, a lot of times, people who write about certain subjects, they don't always maybe participate. However, in the New York demonstration, Gore was in the demonstration, several congressmen. Um, there was, a, um, what's it, the head of the UN was in the march. Yeah. He marched, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, yeah. uh, he made a terrific speech, you can Google it. <coughs> he made an awesome speech at the UN conference two weeks ago. And uh, he, when he made Titanic, he, he, he said, I'm quitting show business. I, I, I hate this business. I'm going to be an environmentalist. <laughs> and, and all of his friends said, wait a minute. He said, in order, you know, to be an environmentalist, you need an audience. And if you continue being a star, you have a great audience to, to talk to about the environment. Sure enough, he was in the march. He gave a great speech. And he made a film called 11th Hour, which is really yeah, good. That's good. Yeah, so, I mean, celebrity power helps. But uh, I was in the 40th anniversary, uh, uh, I was in the, I was on the committee for the 48th anniversary of the free speech movement. And during one of our meetings, Lynn Sabio, Mario's wife, she threw up her hands and she said, you know, she said, what good were the 60s movements? She said, we, we ended up with Reagan, and now we have Bush. <laughs> and I interjected right away and I said, listen, they may have lost, not lasted forever, they accomplished certain things, but you know, those movements of the 60s are going to be a model for future generations. And sure enough, the Occupy movement referred to all the 60s movements and Mario's speeches all the time. And the same thing with the environmental movement. They're referring to the 60s movements because they were very successful movements and a good model for the future. We have time for just one more question, and I've seen your hand up. So I, I was just curious. So one of the things that, you know, in I've heard different people talk about is that so if you have an economic model, you go 50 years out, your future discounting pretty much goes to mm -hmm. just about any cost goes to zero. Yeah. Yeah. So when people who are making economic decisions do their models, climate change just doesn't even register. And and I was at a conference last winter, and they talked about um, that in North America, their predictions, their economic predictions for the impacts of climate change for 50 years out are nothing much. But like Bangladesh will be underwater, and all these other places will be experiencing these really devastating effects. So it kind of gets back to what I think you were saying earlier, that people with the power, most of the power worldwide, are in the northern latitudes where, mm. to the extent of their economic model, they're going to be doing OK. But they're kind of, by going business as usual, they're just accepting this kind of catastrophe in, in other parts of the world mm. that they don't see every day. They're, they're dependent on the tropics. So how, how do you For get food. people to care about something that doesn't yeah. hit them? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it, too, is, is that, right so, I mean, these economic models only take in so much of these right. externalities. Right. That's and true. so, they you know, more. we think that we're not going to experience mm -hmm. any kind of right. events that are economically disruptive. But, I mean, how many more years of this level of California drought can we take right. before we start to realize, or, or really, it's the whole Southwest, too. Um, and then how do you, can you attribute that to? <laughs> although up there, the changes are, so those are the most rapid changes, although, and you can have problems when you build homes on essentially permafrost and the permafrost melts. And, but um, yeah, I mean, so the details of how this plays out will frequently surprise us, and we're just kind of moving forward with our ability to kind of regionalize some of these. And so I think what we'll see is, is that, and, and it's accelerating too. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the temperature, uh, it's not linear, see? 
I mean, you know, well, I don't know if it shows up that well here, but you know, this is not linear. This is, you know, it's rising. And again, these are just models as well. So you know, because CO2 is, so there, and then we've already locked in. So as the years go on, there are going to be more and more kind of climate surprises that start to impact the economies. And then, so the, again, we're, when, when, when is the point at which we say, OK, enough is enough? Huh? I mean, some, I mean, Germany's kind of said enough is enough already, right? I mean, they've got, they're, like, they're going to be like 80% sustainable carbon-free energy in like a matter of decades, right? So why, California. There, why, isn't there, why aren't there protests at Berkeley about all the money that, that's received from BP? I mean, that would be the equivalent of the FSM movement, I think, locally in this, in this intellectual environment. Yeah. Like all the money that's given. There was a site. If you looked at, I think it's here. I, 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 tried, I wanted to find, um, there was something here about the regents divesting. But then I saw another side. It was back over here, and I was actually trying to find it. It just had apathy in huge but, letters. But that's happening <laughs> this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have time to go any further. But I really want to thank Professor Chambers for this very fascinating. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much.